So I'll talk a little bit about what we're up to, I guess. But I wanted to pick up this question as well of scaling explicitly and then data. Because it occurs to me that a lot of the work that I think we're trying to do, I'm trying to do at the Catapult, is beyond data, as in data and then what? Um, and that'll become clear, I suppose. I'm thinking about data in a sense a little bit like this, uh, this other Englishman with a beard did um, a long time ago, um, who's Rainer Banham, who's an architectural historian. And he wrote about actually the power of plumbing and electricity and air conditioning and drop ceilings and lighting on architecture and urbanism. Um, because architecture and urbanism was completely ignoring the fact that that is largely what had changed the way that buildings work throughout the 20th century. He wrote this book in the late 60s about that. So the drop ceiling in here, for instance, enabled an entirely different kind of room and space and function to emerge when it came into buildings. Before that, you, couldn't, you just couldn't do it. And it occurs to me that data is, in a sense, a bit like that. It's a bit like the service layer coursing through things and powering things that enables things to change. The question is then, Again, to do what, though? So how, what's the kind of city outcome, if you like, if data is that kind of service layer? And that's driven by another, sorry to keep going back to yet another English architect from the 60s, 70s, Cedric Price, who uh, said this in 1965 when we had this previous kind of technology fueled era of optimism around uh, tech infrastructure, which at the time you might say was largely around cars and highways and so on. Um, and some other stuff as well, but uh, throughout urbanism, you can see urban planning was changing in response to that. And he said, technology is the answer, but what's the question? And he said that a long time ago, and we still don't ask that enough. We jump on a solution with that stuff and say, well, hang on, what kind of city do we want in the first place? So, so the question I'm coming to is, you know, how does tech, and including data within that, change urban spaces, buildings, infrastructure, products, services, the stuff we use and live in and do? So like the previous speakers, I'm a designer, I'm a driven by human-centered design, it's the practice that I've done. But the question is again, to do what? And how should it change? That's the, again, what you're driven as, as a designer is, well, what's the right thing to do? What's the ethical thing to do? What's the thing that will generate a feasible, a desirable, uh, a viable business or a product or service or governance or space or building and so on? And this is the final architect, I assure you, <laughs> in a bevy of them early on. Um, and this is sometimes attributed to other people like Alan Kay, but it's a quote I like. The best way to predict the future is to try to make something happen to design it. So, so with that in mind, I realized that um, I used to work here at Arup a few years ago in the Smart Cities team and the Foresight team and the Urban Planning team, somehow in three teams simultaneously. And uh, the work that I was doing at the time was around smart cities, I guess we'd call it. And I'd often end up drawing this kind of diagram of a cloud of data floating above the city. Because it was like we thought, well, the city will be generating all this data one way or another through transport and food and all the things we've talked about. And we'll be able to pull that out and understand what's going on as if it's a cloud floating above it. This was Barangaroo in Sydney. This was the one I did for Mazda in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we tried to make it almost literal for the London Olympics, but uh, came second in that competition, which is probably a blessed relief because we had no idea actually how to make this thing. Um, it was uh, the Boris's favorite. I don't know what Russell Brand would have made of it, but anyway, probably something quite good. Um, this was the idea of a big reflective kind of smart meter at a civic scale, a neighborhood scale. This structure would reflect the data back into the environment that it was being produced in. And I realized that I drew this on the train coming back from Ghent last night, which is why it looks like Ghent <laughs> in terms of a city. So sorry about that. It could be Wolverhampton. It could be <laughs> Dudley. Um, but anyway, the, so the shift from that kind of net of data floating over the city, I realize what I'm driven by now actually is something quite different, which is like it's all kind of in there now. It's actually changing the way that the street works, changing the way that things work in the city. It's not just this abstract thing that floats above it that we can examine and then you know, change the way it runs over time, but it's actually changing the services itself, the service layer of cities. So I started thinking in terms of how does it change environments, buildings, objects, services? And by environments, I'll take a few through projects now to make it a bit more literal. So one thing we're looking at at the catapult is air air quality. In London in particular, we have terrible air quite often. The air on Oxford Street is sometimes measured as the worst in the world, depending on how you measure it, but nitrogen dioxide in particular from diesel buses and taxis and what's a relatively narrow canyon. 
Um, and that's a, you know, worse than Beijing for that kind of thing. So it's kind of extraordinarily bad. And we've studied a big rollout of air quality sensors, but low cost air quality sensors. So instead of the Met Office ones that can cost tens of thousands, these are cheap-ish ones, which cost a few hundred quid, up to a grand, that kind of thing. Which means that we can have about a hundred of them out there now um, in Enfield Town Center alone. Which means, again, that people can engage with them. The Met Office sensors, if you know where they are, you're doing well, because most people don't. They're, they're hidden, effectively, because they're scientific instruments. Uh, these are ones that you could engage with. But it occurs to me that uh, data, throwing more data at the thing itself doesn't change it. This is the first recorded complaint of air quality in London I could find from 1661 by uh, John Evelyn, who was a, a man about town at the time, and he wrote a letter to the king complaining about the quality of the air. And he wrote it in a very careful language, because if you can complain to that particular king, you might lose your head. Um, but it's kind of an amazing document. It's called Fumifugium, the inconvenience of the air and smoke and London dissipated, together with some remedies humbly proposed. So it's kind of amazing, actually. It's worth reading. You can find the PDF of this online. But we've known the air in London is bad for a very long time. In a way, we don't need the data uh, to tell us that. Um, it's clearly bad at times. But the question is then, what do you do about it? So. So that comes back to these things again. The small one, the small box there is, our, is the Intel Air Quality Sensor that we're working with. It's a uh, UK science, UK SME called Science Scope, based out near Bath, um, who make the sensors. Intel who make the box and the boards. That gives us something that we can start engaging citizens around the idea of air, understanding air directly. But actually, as well, it helps us understand what you might call green infrastructure: parks, um, rivers, lakes. That blue infrastructure, it's literally, but anyway, or grey, or brown in London often. But, uh, but green infrastructure, the relationship of parks to healthy living, for instance. We inadvertently design cities to make people unhealthy quite often. Uh, so how do we design them to make them healthier? We can do, but we just don't have the data on that relationship in the right form. Our health data is often national, regional, because that's how we run health in this country. Planning decisions are hyper-local. There's not a very good relationship between the two. What we need to make there is a tool in the space in between to enable health impact assessments to be meaningful. Other ways of reading the city. This is something we did for a project where we, um, that's a fellow from CASA in the background at UCL who has a modified EEG sensor, so it's looking at brain activity. And we had people walk around the city. This guy's visually impaired, as it happens. And they build these stress maps of the city. We haven't really been able to understand this again. We sort of instinctively know that the red bit there is Tottenham Court Road, and that's quite stressful, whether you're sighted or not. <laughs> But uh, we didn't really know that, say, the green spaces are equally calming, whether you're sighted or not. So you have to see the trees to actually feel the benefit from them. Which is, again, you might instinctively think that, but we can begin to start putting some, something behind that now. So new ways of reading the city. And this isn't a kind of a strong tradition, I think, of actually understanding the city. This is William H. White stuff. You could look at Jan Gales, to some extent, Jane Jacobs, and so on. In terms of understanding the way that urban spaces perform, this, this guy's quite brilliant, by the way, filmed from 1980 again about understanding why spaces work and what they do. They used cameras and just trained them from the tops of buildings like this and did hours and hours and hours of studies. Still not done enough. Buildings. We know buildings can change through digital dynamics. So the WikiHouse um, 2.0 project was something that uh, Arab put some work into. It was led by Zero Zero Architecture Studio. We helped with it a bit. Wikihouse is an open source modular self-build housing system, which is, sounds very fancy, but basically means you can download a um, set of machine instructions to a CNC router, which just cuts out wood into patterns, which you can then hammer together with a mallet. Nicely, they, the router also cuts out the mallet for you, so everything kind of comes in. And uh, you can put it together, two or three people to put it together, no construction experience, and you can make a 70 square meter two-story house now out of this thing. It's amazing. And the tolerances are really good. I know this looks like giant IKEA, but um, actually it's, it's properly insulated. Arab did some work on the services. It's got USB power in it. I mean, more advanced than what the housing market tends to produce, interestingly. But it's an open source system, so you get a massive diversity of designs and possibilities within it. Having said that, this is not a very diverse design, but this is the one that we helped make. Uh, and the important thing about this was we made this for London Design Festival. These guys made this, we helped a bit. And people could walk in it and experience it again. And half of them walk in and go, this is like a big IKEA cupboard. I could never live in this. And the other half go, this is amazing. I could have a house for three grand or thereabouts. You know, that's extraordinary. It's made out of plywood or OSB. It's super cheap. 
The real issue there, of course, is land value prices in the UK. So that's the interesting thing to flush out. Again, the data kind of is powering all of this stuff. But the question is, again, where are the blockages? What's, the, what's stopping that possible radical disruption of housing as a system? Actually, it's land value. So the answer, ultimately, is things like community land trusts and things like that. You make the thing, though, to kind of get to that point, to so kind of flush out these issues, flush out, is it diverse or ethical enough? completely different scale. We did a project for United Arab Emirates around 2030, which, you know, Dubai is sort of like dog years. 2030 for them is about 2100 for us. But anyway, they kind of, they move a lot quicker around certain things. This was um, a responsive air conditioning. So you walk under these things, sensors trigger, and they release a cooling vapor of just water mist, like a water-cooled mist that you walk through. So instead of air conditioning an entire room, it follows where people are and produces a mist at that point. So you only need to basically condition where there are people. That could radically change, again, the way that places like Dubai or Sydney or Caracas, for that matter, handle air conditioning. It's driven by sensors and data and Internet of Things, essentially. But again, we're trying to get to the what could you do with that element there. And again, by making the prototype, this is an MIT collaboration, it flushes out. Would that work? Is that a good idea? Is that a bad idea? Is anybody going to buy that? Is anybody? Well, how does it feel? Do you feel weird that you're being tracked? But then actually, it's not really tracking you as a person. It's just tracking you as a shape. You could throw a football under it, and the thing would still trigger. So yeah, that's the, you only get to that, again, in making it. This one was a, um, a collaboration with the UK startup around digital signage. So, but a physical sign, like an old-style train station display that kind of uh, goes chuk, 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 and makes a new message, essentially. But by putting the internet in the back of it via um, Zigbee and various other things, um, you're able to then produce something which has a physical outcome. That's a physical sign. Those are things of physical pixels. The head's just flipping them on and off. And it's, yeah, it's got digital dynamics in the back. So you can change things on demand, but when it's set, it's using no energy. So that could replace all of the crappy LED screens that you see in buildings left, right, and center, which are pumping out energy all the time but barely changing their message at all. Objects. Um, with Microsoft UK and Guide Dogs for the Blind, we helped uh, this wearable prototype um, come to life. So she's visually impaired, and that prototype thing has a gyroscope, potentiometer, accelerometer in it. It can tell where she's looking in space and where she is. It's talking to the phone in her pocket. And the phone in her pocket is talking to Bluetooth LE beacons embedded in the environment, so in stations, or on trains, or on bus stops, and so on. With all of that, it makes a 3D soundscape that she can walk through unaided by another person. There's 180,000 people in the UK that, barely, that can't leave their home unaided by other people. Uh, unemployment rate amongst uh, visually impaired is 70%, so it's kind of an extraordinary waste of humans, if you like, if you see it in that way. Um, she's still using a guide dog, so relax. There's no guide dogs going out of business. Anybody that likes guide dogs, it's just <laughs> guide dogs cost about £40,000 to train. We can't make enough of them to cover all of the visually impaired people we have. So this is, again, as a prototype to flesh out what you might do. Now, this really is about navigation and wayfinding in the city in the near future. What happens when you have Bluetooth LED beacons around? What services could you produce? We're using, in the nicest sense, visually impaired people as lead users, kind of extreme users of the urban environment in a way, to try and understand how, whether a pasty shop pinging you as you walk past is a good idea or a bad idea. Probably a bad idea. Maybe Rick might like it. I don't know. But <laughs> um, and a healthy pasty, of course. So, but equally, you could, when you get to the bus stop, it can say, you're at the bus stop, the number four is two minutes away, you know, the free seats are at the front, all the stuff that Ema knows more about um, than, than I, but, it, you know, that, that data is beginning to emerge. It's how do you wrap it into a user experience that's interesting to us, I think. That asks, what is the street furniture of the 21st century? You know, there's uh, two great British designs. David Mellor did the uh, traffic light. Not that David Mellor, for those of you who don't know the designer, David Mellor based in Havisage, um, did many other things. And then Kinnear and Calvert, Margaret Calvert and Jock Kinnear did the road sign system. The UK has a strong design heritage in this area. What would it mean as those things become connected? Robots. <laughs> Dubai, robots. Those things go together quite well in a funny way. Um, so we tried to flesh out, well, what could you do with maintenance robots? That's actually an Italian beach cleaning robot, uh, which is a real thing, by the way. But we pretended it was a street cleaning robot. So, you know, if you had a Roomba and it was for the streets, is that a good thing or a bad thing? How's that going to work? Is that, how's that going to work alongside people? How's that going to work alongside traffic? Can it navigate its way around? 
that wouldn't, isn't that an interesting question? What about sewer cleaning robots? What about little robots can go down storm gullies? Things that can clean the photovoltaic cells on the 72nd floor? Things we don't necessarily want people to be doing. Can, converse is that, what about all those jobs? What are the social is ethical issues with that? Again, you only get to these points when you make the thing. So whether this, I took this film in Greenwich last week, produced from a tower, but um, that guy's pushing that thing. There's no doubt that a robot could do what that guy is doing. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Open question. You only get to that if you get to the design of a service, the design of a potential product. Finally, services. So the service layer in city is now perhaps the most radically transformational and the one that uh, traditional urbanism is least equipped to deal with. So part of that is around the way that we make decisions about cities, as again the other speakers have spoken about. And we, we did some works um, helping the GLA, the Great London Authority, think about platforms for conversations with people. And there are many startups in this area, like Commonplace or Sticky World, there's Space Hive here, which the, the Mayor of London then used to run a neighborhood funding campaign. Loads of interesting innovation in this area, though. The Park Lot project in Los Angeles gives people a kit of parts in the form of, again, construction diagrams and things to enable them to build mini parks in parking lots. These ones are then within kind of regulations, but what you do with the park is up to you. So it's giving, it's the complete flip of the traditional city approach about waiting for you to come up with an idea and then telling you no in various ways. <laughs> Here's the city reaching out and saying, this is what you can do, over to you to do it with. Different approach on openness, I think, actually, because it's far more crafted. It's a service design process behind that. But it could be like this. This is how they do it in Switzerland. When they're doing a planning application, they make the building in uh, these kind of structures, these ghost structures called Baugespan in front of the thing. They leave that up there for a while, see what you think about the scale of it. Does that feel all right or appropriate or not? So that scaffolding is describing an, a proposed application for planning. Um, in Chile, I'd actually say Latin America is further ahead on this stuff than anybody else in the world in terms of genuine citizen collaboration around city making. This is a great project around Constitucion, which you don't have time to go into. So maybe Google Mauchos or Constitucion or the re rebuilding thereof. They remaster planned their city in 90 days with 93% turnout in the vote and full public approval. It's both thinking through very carefully in a very smart way, uh, no pun intended, um, how to collaborate with citizens about the building of the city. 90 days is extraordinary for a city master plan. This is a city of 30, 40,000 people, not a tiny village or anything. And this is how we do it in the UK. Um, some of you have seen before, I wrote about this the other day, but we, we, instead we tie a piece of paper to a lamppost in the rain and I hope you look at it. That's that. We can probably do better. I'll leave, you, leave it at that. Um, <laughs> Uh, the question about scale is really important. And, you know, what should we scale and why? We shouldn't scale everything. Things are local. Cities are actually local. There's a really, I think, big challenge about why would you scale something. In terms of open data, something like CityMapper is a kind of a well-trodden, uh, uh, well, well -trod uh, success story, I guess, frequently trotted out, sorry. Um, powered by the data store and other things like OpenStreetMap and Foursquare, now Yelp, I think. Um, and it's a successful venture capital funded startup. The interesting question there is, what should TfL get back from CityMapper? If anything, open question. Is it good enough that that's on half the smartphones in London, probably, and people are using it as a good thing? Possibly not. I'd argue TfL now know less about the way Londoners move around than CityMapper do, potentially. CityMapper know at genuine origin destination data, my house to the pub. All TfL know is the number 43 bus stop to Old Street Roundabout or something like that. Um, so they're missing out a vast amount of picture on what CityMapper has generated on top of TfL data. They've added extra strategic value. There's also financial value there. Interesting question. Should the contract around open data include a percentage of finances gained at some point by the company if it goes public or if it floats or if it's funded? Arguably, arguably not. I don't know. I have no idea, to be honest, but I put that in front of you. I'm actually more interested in the strategic value, because if TfL could pull that strategic information back in about how Londoners move around, they can deliver a better transport service, which, of course, CityMapper relies on anyway, and we all rely on. So you'd want to have that, but currently I don't think they have any particular right to see the value-added extra strategic value that CityMapper generated. So again, by, by looking at the application and the service, we get to some really knotty questions around open data. Finally, the way that services are changing things, Airbnb is radically changing the way that urban fabric is used. 
as a service layer. A few lines of code has changed the way that the fabric is being used. Uber is changing the way that mobility happens to some degree. Not massively, but somehow massively enough to be worth $40 billion in terms of valuation, which is bigger than most things in the built environment business. But that's kind of an extraordinary thing. Again, a few lines of code. They don't own any cars any more than Airbnb own any space. But they're both changing the way that the city happens. Bridge is possibly more interesting, again, a predictive on-demand transit system, a bus that basically goes where the demand is. They use social media to do predictive analytics to say, well, there's probably going to be a need for a bus over there in 12 minutes. Let's send a bus in that direction. It works. It's kind of over and above the traditional 20th century route. Again, in the Dubai exhibition, we flushed out some of these things by making these fake self-driving cars and having people sit in them and say, if you don't have a steering wheel in a car, what do you use it for? Well, it might as well be an office, or it could be, you know, it could be anything, right? So, so to experience that change the way that people thought about it. Um, there are key issues here. If we had a shared on-demand autonomous fleet, big if, 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 if we did though, we could reduce the need, MIT argue, for private cars in the city by 70%. That's a city like Singapore, let's say in London, 50%, 40%, I don't know. Extraordinary number. Again, the impact is on parking space, if nothing else. Never mind air quality, health, all of those other things, carbon and so on. But that's a completely different approach, driven by data, but the value is derived when you make something with it. The question there is then, what kind of city do we want? These are the taxi drivers out on strike about Uber. So, what kind of city do we want? That's a long way from open data, I know, but ultimately I think that's where we need to move the conversation. I'll skip that. Just the final thing then. So, my question is, in the spirit of Cedric, uh, how do we ensure these technologies are well considered, that they create a sense of the city as a public good, a better future city? That's the question that's driving us. There's a whole set of things that I won't go through them, but they're all basically a design human-centered design-led approach, iterative, prototyped, starting at the street level, assessing exactly what to scale, because not everything needs to scale, not everything should scale, um, and making it tangible. Thank you very much. <laughs>